There are other techniques that we're going to study as well. One of them is called synthetic aperture radar, which is a radar technique that allows extremely sharp resolution, very high resolution. And uh, this technique also allows you to observe the Earth in different polarizations. And various techniques have been used now to take those polarizations, those in, that information in various polarizations, and to map it and classify it into different uh, types of land. So, for example, this is a land surface classification in Germany using an X-band polarimetric synthetic aperture radar, the so-called Terrasar radar. And from that, you can determine what kind of crops are growing, uh, whether land is forested or not, uh, whether land is urban or not. And this is extremely important from the standpoint of, of land management. You can also determine the height of surfaces very precisely. This is a digital elevation map obtained using one of the ERS synthetic aperture radars. And modern digital elevation mapping has provided us essentially global elevation maps to about a few meters accuracy over the entire globe. This is something that we had no database on uh, before about the middle 1990s. The first such experiment was on a space shuttle where the shuttle spent about two weeks mapping the globe digitally for the first time. And now we're doing this more regularly from some of the more operational satellites we've launched. These digital elevation maps, by the way, are something you can obtain pretty easily as well. You can go into the internet, you can uh, Google the appropriate sources and download this data. You can also look at how the elevation is changing over time. And you can do this to extreme precision by looking at the phase of the reflected signal. So if you have a synthetic aperture radar and you're getting a return from it at one point, and then later on, maybe a year later or two years later, you fly over that same area, you can compare the phases of the return signals. And those phase differences show up as fringes. And where the fringe frequency starts increasing very rapidly, that's where the land turns out to be shifting. And so, for example, one can look at where stress is being manifested as strain, which is a physical motion of the Earth's crust, just by looking at these interference fringes. There's some rather interesting applications of this as well. You can look at how, for example, the land is subsiding in various places. This is a place in California where there's an oil field. They've been pumping out the ground, and the land actually is subsiding, and you can see that in the differential SAR satellite imagery. Here's a place in Las Vegas where the groundwater has been depleted. This is exaggerated, but you can see that the ground indeed is subsiding. There are places where actually where you don't even need a satellite to see this. You can uh, you go over and, and literally see people's driveways that have dropped about a half a meter or a meter in height because of the subsidence. subsidence excuse me. And you can also look at what happens in an urban area when you're doing construction. This is a recent Terrasar X differential SAR image showing the perturbation of the contour along this line here in Budapest as a result of underground construction. So when you put a subway in, now you can determine what happens to the surface pretty precisely. I'm going to go on a little bit more because there are a lot of really neat applications before we really start getting into the, uh, the meat of remote sensing. But uh, there are a lot of things you can see in remote sensing that you might not expect. Uh, in synthetic aperture radar, for example, over the ocean, we oftentimes see what look like breaking waves. What these really are, these are, by the way, too big in scale to be the typical breaking wave on the surface. These are internal waves in the ocean. These are internal waves that are caused by large currents coming up over rises in the ocean bottom, for example, at the edge of a continental shelf, then create internal waves, and these internal waves can be tens or hundreds of kilometers long. Well, these internal waves cause very tiny changes in the surface currents of the ocean. Those surface currents, to make a long story short, there's a very complicated process, those surface currents modulate the amount of roughness on the ocean surface. That roughness is directly observed by backscatter into the satellite. And so we can actually observe into the ocean these internal waves just by the way these internal waves modulate the roughness on the ocean surface. It's a very, very interesting effect, a very complicated effect as well. And it's in fact still being understood from a physical standpoint, but it's very clear that uh, you can make these observations.
You can also, by the way, observe oil slicks extremely well. There have been some experiments where people have taken no more than a gallon of oil, gone out with a motorboat, spread the oil around the surface of the ocean. Now, you're not supposed to do this because it's not environmentally sound, but nonetheless. A small amount of such oil distributed over several kilometers causes enough change in the surface tension of the water to change the amount of roughness on the ocean surface and thereby to very significantly change the amount of backscatter that is seen by these synthetic aperture radars. So from the standpoint of mapping oil slicks or any sort of uh, either anthropogenic or natural slick, uh, one can do that pretty well with, uh, with radar just by measuring the roughness on the surface. So there's a lot we can do with shorter wavelengths as well. This is an infrared picture of the globe using the NOAA geostationary orbiting satellite, GOES as it's known. And uh, this takes, of course, very nice 24-hour, seven-day-a-week pictures. Now, I have to be a little bit careful about that. The optical imager on GOES doesn't take 24-hour pictures. It's only going to be useful during sunlight. But the infrared sensor on GOES will, because it's observing thermal infrared radiation, it'll take pictures 24 hours a day. And these pictures are very useful because uh, these clouds are cold, they appear radiometrically cold, and we can therefore determine where clouds are. And if you can determine where clouds are, you've got at least one important variable that's useful for meteorological forecasting. Unfortunately, you can't see through the clouds, though, and this is one of the big problems with the infrared wavelengths. Nonetheless, very useful for a lot of purposes. And if you map that cloud top temperature into altitude, because, of course, the higher you go in, in the atmosphere, the colder the temperature, you can actually get three-dimensional maps of the cloud tops. For example, this cloud top image that was obtained over Hurricane Gilbert. When it's clear, when you don't have clouds, you can also see down to the surface with very high resolution with optical systems. The Landsat system has been operating for almost 30 years now, and this is allowing uh, increased resolution over the years as people uh, refine the optics, and increased number of bands as people build these sensors with more and more radiometric bands. And these are very useful, for example, for mapping fine features on the surface of the Earth, again, during clear times. We can also map things like lights. Now you might want to say, well, why do you want to map lights? Well, lights pertain to energy usage, lights pertain to population, lights pertain to commerce even. And so there's a lot of information one can gain just by determining how the lights at night over the globe are changing. Are there areas in the third world, for example, where we really can't access data, where we can learn something about people's patterns by just observing the lights? And the answer is very much uh, yes. Finally, there are a lot of places we can't get to where observations using remote sensing have been uh, absolutely essential in making discoveries. And astronomy is, of course, the prime example of that. This is an image of Cygnus A. Uh, by the way, this 100,000 light year uh, circle here, that's the diameter of our galaxy. Cygnus A is some celestial source with jets emanating from it that remain tight and coherent to distances far beyond the diameter of our galaxy. This is some of the extreme physics that we observe through remote sensing that are still not yet explained, but are extremely fascinating. This was obtained actually with an array of antennas called the Very Large Array. This is located in Socorro, New Mexico. And this array observed this image at a frequency of 5 gigahertz. This array is something that we will study. It's called a synthetic aperture array. Um, now, we'll use synthetic aperture a number of times in the course here, but there's synthetic aperture radar. There's also synthetic aperture radiometry. And this is an example of synthetic aperture radiometry. We essentially can synthesize a very large antenna to get very high angular resolution, but rather than using a huge filled aperture antenna that would be extremely expensive, we use a number of smaller antennas and we link them together. So we'll talk about how that works as we go through the course as well.